do you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Joe Cordell, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. Uh, I'll apologize in advance for my voice. Jill, something seems to be going around this year. I, I have the same thing, feeling sniffly, the sinuses draining. I don't know if it's the weather or something's going around. Yeah, you, you always wonder, is it allergies or is it some sort of bug out there? Yeah, a virus. I'm just glad it's not the flu. I don't want the flu. Yeah, yeah. And we don't feel any of those symptoms. I don't, at least. You know, I have not had the flu, knock on wood, since February of 2008. Wow. Now, is that, is that when you took a flu vaccine? No, no. I only took the flu vaccine maybe four years ago, and that was the only time. But And that's only good for a year, right? Or right, so, if right. you take it every year. But that was the only time, and, you know, I don't know how I've escaped it. Well, maybe your immune system has gotten stronger. It must be. You've probably been under no stress in the last oh, 10 years. Oh, no, none at all. Well, in any case, speaking of stress, we're going to talk about a subject that we've talked about before, but it it is uh, such a critical issue to our listeners, and that's how do you have somebody make decisions for you when something happens to you, such as a stroke, or it could be a heart attack, it could be maybe some rapidly progressing dementia, but in any case... People who don't plan can find themselves in a situation where other people are running their lives and doing a bad job of it. Yes. So the one thing that we want to take care of, I mean, if we, had, if we list only two or three things that we got to get right before we're in a position that we can't get them right, one of those certainly would be, if you're over 60, is assuring that you have in place somebody to take over the moment that you have that car accident or that stroke or whatever it is. All too often, people just assume that, you know, next day is going to be like this day. And kind of you go on like that until it isn't. You never know what a day is going to bring. Yeah, exactly. You don't mm-hmm. know when that day is going to come, but we know it's going to come, right? right? A day when we can't do what we did the previous day in a dramatically different way. So the best device to accomplish that generally is a durable power of attorney. And explain what that means and when does that go into effect? Those of you who are familiar with what a durable power of attorney is, don't tune out because we're going to we're going to take this to a real life application here in a few moments that I think will make graphic, you know, the ways in which a durable power of attorney can be hugely, hugely game changing for you and your loved ones. So um, just in a nutshell, we would say that a power of attorney is this piece of paper where you give someone the ability to be you. Now, that's an overstatement, but to some extent, you can think of it like that. If it's broadly worded, it means that they get to go to your bank accounts, your retirement accounts, your real estate, all those things in your life that need attending to. And some things, of course, need attending to more regularly than others. For example, paying your bills and, and assuring that, that your electricity is not cut off and assuring your property taxes are paid and all those Somewhat urgent things, communicating right. with employers as needed if you're not in a position to return to a job. Somebody who will do the things that if you were able to, you would be doing. Is it in effect immediately once it's, say, signed and notarized or does it go into effect once you become incapacitated in some way? How does that work? Well, generally, unless you have what's called a springing provision, then it's in effect immediately. So it does mean that that if you give someone this authority – they could, the moment they have this document in their hand, go off and do you know bad things. But, I mean, the whole idea about this role is you're choosing somebody you trust. Uh, Hopefully. It's, yeah. It's, I mean, if, if you're in a position where you wouldn't feel good, your daughter or your son having this authority, then, yeah, you don't want to give it to them, number one. But number two, you probably have other issues that, that have, fl- mm-hmm. have flared up in the past and you expect to in the future. But – I think most people have people in their life. Often it's a spouse. Then it's their kids would be the normal order that people would choose to fill these. Would you be hesitant in giving uh, – you know, drawing up power of attorney papers for someone that isn't a relative of the client? 
Yeah, that makes me a little nervous. Uh, it does. You do want some objective measure of confidence, something you can look to to where you feel good about it. I'm always reluctant to recommend somebody for this role to a client unless it's a professional or somebody who's backed by insurance and things like that, uh, liability insurance, and, a, and then maybe an established reputation. But sometimes the assets aren't there to warrant that sort of person. Let me let me explain, though, the other option. The other option is that you can have it spring into effect. You can have an event that occurs in which then it becomes valid. For example, you could say that when two doctors – certify that you're incompetent. You could say when one doctor certifies that you're incompetent. Okay. You could choose a panel of family members. Sometimes that's good. If you have one kid you don't feel really good about and you have four kids, maybe they have to all agree uh, on this subject that you're not competent. Here's the downside of that. The downside of that is that it can really slow things down. It means that if you want this thing in effect immediately, say there's been a car accident and you need someone to make some quick decisions, perhaps relating to monies for insurance or or to answer personal questions even, I mean, with HIPAA and all these other privacy laws. So it can be a drag at the very time that you don't want there to be a drag. Right. And if you're in another country when it happens, you definitely have slowed things down. So a lot of people figure, well, look, and, and I like this reasoning. If this is somebody that you can't trust when you're competent, why would you want her to be in charge when you're incompetent? Well, sure. So so the whole idea is if it's somebody that you trust when you're incompetent, then maybe you can trust them when you're competent. Right. Um, but uh, it definitely can be a springing provision to where it doesn't come into effect until the time. And and I get it. If this is a for somebody who's a professional, not a family member, a third party, then it's a better argument for a springing document than otherwise. But here's the alternative, just so everybody gets this. The alternative is that something happens to you, you can't make decisions, no one has the power to make decisions for you because you're an adult, and adults are uh, enshrouded in all these powers and laws Mm -hmm. and protections. So somebody has to file an action in a probate court. Yes, probate. Doesn't mean you have to be dead. You can be incompetent. So when an action is filed in probate, then lawyer fees are incurred, Maybe a doctor a doctor's probably going to be uh, retained to do an investigation. Uh, GAL, guardian ad litem, will be appointed. There will be testimony, et cetera, court costs. Guess who's paying all these costs? Not your family members. Probably coming out of your money. Right. So um, then, then, of course, you're going to have a guardian who probably will charge you. I mean, it's fair enough. I mean, these are maybe a lawyer that's appointed. Uh, it could be a number of people that might qualify. It could be a family member that's appointed. As a matter of fact, the courts would probably prefer that. Uh, and if it's a family member, maybe there wouldn't be pay. But but generally, if there are third parties, there's definitely compensation. And and this is this is a very unfriendly, um, uh, protracted process that no one wants to go through. And to think that you can avoid it with a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so easy to avoid. This is not something that requires a ton of money to prevent. You can, with very little cost, you can have a durable power of attorney. There's no excuse for everyone who's over 60 not having in place one of these documents. And you can control in the document how far you want to go. If you want people to be restricted as to where they can't touch some things by statute, they can't change your will. So it can be managed. Yeah, it can be managed. You can have limitations on it, uh, and you can craft it and limit it. Uh, if you went with what the statutory boundaries are, which some people do, they'll just say, you know, I hereby give the authority granted by the statute of Missouri for, for durable powers of attorney to so-and-so. I mean, you can have something that brief and to the point, essentially, and it'd be valid. And, but that means that they can, for example, transfer assets in or out of a trust, uh, assuming you give them specific authority but not if you don't give them specific authority. So if you just had that language and adopted the language of the statute, then they couldn't do that. And they also, even with your permission, they cannot change your estate planning, meaning your your wills. They can change a trust with your permission, but not uh, a, right. uh, a will. So there are limits. But I wanted to, to open this show and have us talk a little bit about, remind people about the importance of a durable power of attorney what its alternatives are, which is probate court, guardianship, conservatorship. And then we wanted to take an additional step and sort of see how 
these documents come into play in real life and perhaps find here a cautionary tale for things that can go wrong. I mean, if even in the best scenarios, right. things can go wrong, and we'll look for lessons here. So we have, for this purpose, uh, our, our ever-popular, roving celebrity reporter, Dan, who uh, has been hot on the trail of this story, which uh, I think it emanates from Florida. Yes. yes and it, it relates does. to uh, – there are several things where this train went off the track, but it relates yes. in, part to, in part to a durable power of attorney. There's probably some other things that should have been handled differently. So give us an overview of this, this case. Okay. Well, this case starts out in March of 2017 with 93-year-old, then 92, uh, Maurice Myers. He was living by himself. He only had one daughter. Uh, and then he was hospitalized twice and told doctors basically that he couldn't perform tasks of daily living, couldn't drive. After the second time he was discharged, he moved into a rehabilitation facility where he was diagnosed with kidney failure, hypertension, and heart disease. Now, after he left the facility a couple of months later in May and into Grand Villa of Pinellas Park, which is a senior care facility, his daughter was overseeing his care at, by that point. Okay. She was taking care of him. So yes, that. yes. Um, and oversaw his finances, helped out with any of the decisions being made until October when she died unexpectedly at age 61. Wow. And he had no other children? No children, no family. No wife? No wife. Okay. So he's 92 years old. At the moment she passes away, he's staying in a facility? Yes, a senior care facility. Okay, got it. Yes. Uh, he suffered several falls and showed some signs of dementia, uh, a little bit of incapacitated uh, sense of mind, as it were. Uh, and staff members at the facility had heard from other residents that a professional guardian had done a great job with several other residents at this particular facility. Now, let's stop here and, and let me point out to the listeners that a professional guardian is something that is kind of unique to Florida. There are, there are some other states that have it, but Florida has this really robust law where they regularly acknowledge and certify and, and appoint these professional guardians. And these are people who are have some sort of training. I think they have to com complete like 40 or 50 hours of training, maybe more than that, but not. it's not as if this is a graduate degree. I had <laughs> never heard of that before. It is a little unusual, but I think Florida has so many people, maybe, that are in this position. Maybe their kids are often in some other part of the country, right, right. up north. And so they have this, this law in place for someone to get certified as a professional guardian. But again, don't think that because it says professional guardian, that's like a, a certified public accountant or somebody who has a graduate degree. I think it just requires that you complete this 40 or so hours of training, whatever it is. Sure. And you have to have good character, presumably. So there are a few other things. Uh, the state of Washington has also a professional guardian designation. So I just wanted to insert that here because that's a little unusual. Missouri doesn't have that. But go ahead. So according to records, she had been a guardian for dozens of seniors and ran her own company, the Florida Guardianship Service, as well as was president of the Guardian Association of Pinellas County. Now, Tracy Hudson was her name, then Tracy Samuels. Uh, age 51, she signs the power of attorney on November 9th, 2017, naming her agent and health healthcare surrogate and was added to two of his bank accounts. Okay, well, wait now. So uh, actually, the the aging father, yes. Mr. Myers, yes. uh, he was the one who signed it. He would have signed it giving her permission. Yes. And so remember at this point – She's there because people who work in this facility were concerned about him, and they knew that his daughter had died and there's nowhere else to go. So they kind of already knew that he wasn't capable. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, uh, this this professional guardian person is contacted, and this is not a guardianship. Let me emphasize, this is where a durable power of attorney has right. been signed, signed by this elderly man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would need to be competent to sign this document. We don't know, but mm -hmm. maybe but did, he was. But didn't you say that he was showing signs of dementia? So I'm wondering, how legal was this action? Well, I mean, just because you're showing signs of dementia doesn't mean that it's not valid. 
but it does raise a question mark. But in any case, the people here, I think that those at the senior care home probably had the best of intentions, I'm guessing. They felt they needed to contact someone. They knew this woman uh, that they contacted. So Mr. Myers, he uh, signed this durable power of attorney. Mm -hmm. So so though this woman is a professional guardian, right now she's not acting as a guardian because that's somebody that's appointed by the court. Instead, she's acting based on this legal document, this piece of paper I was talking about a while ago. So she's added to several of his bank accounts and moves Maurice into a memory care facility in May of 2018. And after September of 2018, he was admitted to the hospital again and discharged into a rehab facility. Okay. He Several health issues back and forth, as it were. During the 11 months when she was in charge of his affairs, she allegedly charged him $100 an hour for power of attorney services. She called it. That seems very high. Hundred dollars an hour. It does seem high for someone who's not a lawyer. I don't know. Does she have a college degree? Maybe she does. But the point is, a hundred dollars an hour seems pretty significant, uh, particularly when you have the ability to define an hour pretty broadly. I mean, if she's right. running around doing stuff, running errands for him. I mean, is that a hundred bucks for when she's driving How do you in the car? Justify that. It it did make a lot of sense. And actually, Maurice, before his death, was interviewed by the Department of uh, Children and Families saying he wasn't aware of what she was charging him. So even as this was going on, he really didn't have a good grasp of his own bank account, his own right. how much was being taken out on things and how much was being charged. See, and that's the problem. One of the problems in this scenario, or I should say a potential pitfall. It doesn't have to be a problem, but it, as we talked a while ago, it is important that for there to be trust because really there's no oversight. This is not a guardian. As bad as a guardian is that I described a while ago, at least you do have a judge's oversight. They have to right. submit accountings regularly. They need permission from the court for any major decision. Um, they, the judge will hold them accountable for any dollar they spend, et cetera. So their compensation is monitored. That even though a we all agree that we'd rather have a durable power of attorney where we don't have to go through a court system and our loved ones don't, it is better if you think the alternative is somebody that cannot be trusted. Right, because there's no one to really police in this type of situation. Right. Yeah, there's correct? no one. I mean, it's a the, the person who made the designation is by definition going downhill, and soon will be over that hill in the sense of cognitive impairment. And and this person is really on their own unless you have a family member there that's looking over their shoulder. Right. Yeah. And with no count accountability involved, Tracy transferred five hundred forty one thousand five hundred forty one hundred dollars into two bank accounts that she controlled, and a third bank account which she and her husband controlled. Huh. So. And this was all over eleven month period. Yes. That raises questions. That raises a lot of questions. Well, so. I'm wondering, though, how did this come to the attention of anyone? There were numerous complaints filed toward the uh, Pinellas County Inspector's General's Office. But I wonder if they were – I wonder where the original ones came from, from perhaps someone working in one of these facilities? I, I believe so. With him getting moved around as often as he did, that that raised a lot of eyebrows, especially when it came to medical care, medical treatment, day-to-day living – Between the cognitive impairment that he may or may not have had, on top of just being moved around like that, that it seems very unusual. Well, I think we can be confident he had cognitive impairment. Maybe we're just not confident that he's entirely incompetent. Right. Right. But um, I think that that this is a case where just by happenstance, it ends up getting a hotline call or there's some – perhaps there's even an, an anonymous report, which is sometimes that's what happens is there's an anonymous complaint filed and then an investigation is triggered. But think then how easily this situation, assuming it is what it appears to be, Mm. think how easily this could have gone undiagnosed, undiscovered. I mean, Mm. who is out there? absolutely. And I'm sure it happens all the time. And I suspect that it probably does. I'd like to not say all the time, but you're probably right. She she was in charge of his home sale. She 
wrote 46 different checks with vague memo lines such as caregiver refund and clothing fees. ABC's um, investigation of this event led that she allegedly may have purchased Tampa Bay Buccaneers tickets to go to football games. There were several other uh, purchases well, made that may or may not have been attributed to his account. Well, no, we, we should be careful to say that um, that this is – she's not actually been convicted of anything yet. Yes. Right. So everything we say, we have to say, is an allegation. Yes. Uh, Tampa Bay Times did – a. A lengthy story on this that is pretty informative, and it's interesting for those who want to know more about this uh, incident. But it, let, let's let's bring it to where things stand now. There was a report filed. Then what happened? She filed a libel lawsuit accusing five people of making false reports against her. Right now. They're seeking a judgment of $500,000, and that case is still pending. Meanwhile, she still faces questions regarding the the power of attorney situation and failed to show up for her hearing. And the suit she filed against these women, she called them, referred to them as the vigil anti-mob, accusing them of making false reports. Well, um, at that, apparently there was an investigation that was opened through this uh, Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. And that this this went on for a period of months, this investigation. Yep. And it resulted in uh, her arrest. Uh, and she was charged with exploitation of an elderly person, which is a, a crime in the state of Florida, as well as in, in Missouri. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's a separate uh, felony where certain – People take certain levels of action against a exploitation of an elderly person is defined in terms of uh, dollars as to whether it's a, a, a misdemeanor or a felony. And clearly the dollars involved here would be a felony in the state of Missouri as well. So uh, she's not been tried and convicted, correct? Correct. Uh, she was released on a $250,000 bond and the case is still pending. You know, we'll, we'll take it as granted, just an assumption that mm-hmm. perhaps where there's there's smoke here that there's fire and uh, and ask ourselves you know how might this have been handled differently in this case mr myers uh he had one daughter and and i think that the first point where we could choose to intervene would be if we had the chance would be at that stage to have had her to have a durable power of attorney and then for him to have named a successor right now we don't know who that would be it's possible that that he doesn't know of someone, but at least then you have the chance, while you may not have a personal relationship, a pre-existing relationship, there may still be a way of identifying somebody you can better trust. It would at least allow him and his daughter to participate in deciding, this is the person we want to choose, and you can go ahead and name them in the document so they immediately ascend to that role automatically when the, the person who's on the line above them passes away. Sure, maybe the daughter could have named a close family friend as a successor. Yeah, yeah, it could have been that. It could have been they would have gone to. Um, I'm reluctant to see lawyers in this role, just because lawyers can be expensive, but they're not going to actually be doing the work themselves. They're going to be delegating it, so that saves some money. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, lawyers aren't the best choice for this, in my opinion. Um, I think it's better to have somebody who's closer to the, an opportunity to give that care. If there's a lot of money involved, we know there's at least 500000 here. So maybe there was a million total. I mean, when you have money like that, it is reasonable for you to hire a professional. And professionals are at banks, bank trust departments, right. and, and others that can, can manage things for you. And they actually have real people who go out and, and get stuff done, do tasks for you, and do do nurturing things other than simply manage money. So there are organizations that do that. This process of licensure in the state of Florida just sounds really flimsy. I mean, I'm sure they do a police check. Oh, I'm sure they go through all types of checks. But again, who's going to police yeah, this situation. If you're just tuning in, we're exploring the topic of durable power of attorney. And the durable power of attorney is a wonderful device for the reasons we've already talked about. But it's good for us to acknowledge that there are some circumstances in which it could go south. It, given that we had no other 
person available to participate in this. I guess maybe the lesser evil in this case would have been something such as a guardianship or a conservatorship. Conservatorship just refers to the management of money. Guardianship is the management of a person. We make that distinction in Missouri. In Florida, it all falls under a, a guardianship. So, I mean, despite all the things I say about guardianship, its, it's expense, its unfriendliness, its uh, delay, et cetera, it's better than this scenario. Yes. Now, I have a question. Um, since this lady, uh, Miss Hudson, had power of attorney, with that responsibility, with that, uh, does she have the power to create a will for him? No, she wouldn't. Uh, but, you know, she can – we won't talk about her because still at her case, as we said a while ago, it's still alleged. Right. So let's say can a person in, her, a person. in, in this position have created a will? And the answer is no in Missouri, and I suspect no in Florida. Generally, durable power of attorney statutes, as as I think we've mentioned before, is that they uh, they do have limits, and those limits among them are that you you can only have access to a trust with express permission, and in the document itself, mean you have to expressly deal with it. And then, uh, as to will, statutes generally don't permit it. Period. Because power of attorney ends when the person dies. Correct. Yeah. It does. And now here's the reason, though, that's that's uh, kind of a hollow assurance is that maybe you can't change the will, but you can take all the money and do something with it so that the will has nothing to distribute. But it does create the problem of how do you get it into your name lawfully? So it would be very convenient for somebody who wanted to inherit an estate from an elderly person or to get control of it legally is to do it by way of a will. Because it does create problems. You have to explain every dollar that you that you transfer when you're managing it through a durable mm-hmm. power of attorney. But the biggest problem here for elderly people, and that we want to emphasize in this show, is that this is not a system or a process that has oversight. It's a private sector solution, so to speak. And it hinges upon your making good selections in the people that you place there. You can't count on, as in a case like this, where you might have a hotline call. You can't count on people to necessarily go to the trouble to report this and have a follow-up and have it discovered when there's nobody who's truly interested involved. By interested, I mean that in the legal sense. There's no family member that, that is involved in this and has an interest in right. assuring it's done properly. There are a, a plethora of lessons to be had involving this case as a type of alleged cautionary tale right, for the power right. of attorney. But she also involved herself in another potential case that is still pending involving the sale of a beachside hotel. Now, there was an elderly woman who owned the hotel by the name of Ganita Dearsay. And now she was an immigrant from Lithuania who ran this beachside hotel and she lived with her grandnephew, Getty Pakalanis. And two of them living together, everything is great. Pakalanis goes to visit family in Lithuania. All of a sudden, a real estate agent in the area, Diane Sames, comes around and tries to offer to buy the hotel, as it were. Right Now, she allegedly refuses. Uh, Sames kind of disputes all of that and says that they were on better terms and stuff like that. But when Pakalanis comes back, Dearsay sells it to him for $50,000. Now, this is a beachside hotel. A hotel. A hotel. For $50,000. For $50,000. Oh, my goodness. And what year was this? Uh, this is somewhat recently. It was a 2018 report. Okay. Well, within the last couple of years, we'll say. Yeah. for a beachside hotel in Florida. Now, Hmm. (laughs) the real estate agent decided to dispute the sale, as it were, and say she's not of sound mind in this situation to be able to do this. Right. So she told the courts and the judge agreed and appointed her a guardian. Okay. This guardian – just happened to be Tracy Hudson Okay, from the previous story. Now, the case is still pending. However, the two getting wrapped up in the same the, – the common denominator, it, it leads to a lot of questions. Sure. Well, but so in this case though, uh, the court appoints a guardian mm-hmm. 
and the guardian they appointed was Tracy. Mm -hmm. So after the appointment, did the transaction take place? The transaction is still pending because of the court blocking. So Tracy was going to proceed to sell the hotel. That was kind of the thought process involved, allegedly. She was supposed to kind of foster it. Okay. But she's not been charged in this case, no, correct? No, no, no. Okay. It, it's still more along the lines of the fam, the nephew, Getty, versus uh, Diane Sames, the real estate agent. Okay. Tracy isn't as involved, but there's still there's still questions. Questions. Yes. Yeah, there's still some red flags. Yes. It, it kind of brings up a lot of thoughts regarding guardianship and how it can be manipulated and kind of go south if – if the conditions are correct. Yeah, yeah, I, and I've heard I, I've heard complaints before about the the Florida system. Uh, I think that that Missouri does a much better job in oversight of guardianship. Sure. Mm-hmm. For the reasons I've already mentioned, mm-hmm. but in fairness, I I have to concede that Florida, you know, regularly has complaints that because of the workload and and the you know, how much the systems are having to deal with in terms of guardianships that there's not the checks and balances that you historically see. All those things I was saying that you can count on with the guardianship, they're not foolproof, but they're generally reliable in the state of Missouri. But I, I think in Florida, uh, from what I've, I've heard and read from other, and talked to other lawyers, that, that there, it's not as reliable. And I think this case is an example where uh, maybe there wasn't enough oversight. We don't know. We don't know if, in fact, there was wrongdoing here. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of those things where you raise – it raises a red flag Mm -hmm. and and you still don't have the sort of oversight that you would count on. And and this, in fact, was a guardian. So I think that that there's no perfect system out there. Some people will, again, try to limit – if it's through a durable power of attorney, they'll try to limit it. But I can tell you that – even in this case, you had a real estate transaction. A guardianship is going to require approval of a real estate transaction unless it's already been presented to the court and they've mm-hmm. given a blanket authority for forthcoming real estate transactions. So they can give a blanket authority to go out. Yes, you can sell the real estate. Mm-hmm. But unless you have that with multiple items of real estate, mm-hmm. any any transaction is going to have to be first approved, typically through a guardianship. Mm-hmm. Uh, So in a way, you might say the transaction was discovered by the guardianship process here, but I know that many complain that that those, the court and the court's representatives are simply not monitoring their guardians as well as they should. And maybe it's because of this thing called a professional guardian in the state of Florida. It's too easy to become one of those. Now, with a guardianship, are you required to go to court every so often to account for your the activity involved? Yeah, you have to go to court for certainly annual accountings. And depending on what you want to do, if, uh, if you're going to make a major change in investment above certain dollar amounts, for example, or to in, engage in selling a large asset, then generally you'll have to go specifically to the court and seek approval for those things. Now, you can have guardians who who are less supervised than other guardians. So uh, sometimes courts can give plenary powers, essentially, broad powers, to a guardian to, to run things as they see fit. That's a little exceptional. That would be a circumstance where the court would have extraordinary confidence in this guard, guardian's capabilities and character. Uh, so I guess maybe the better answer to the question is that the, the degree of oversight can vary based on the court's decision in a particular case. Okay. Now, what would you say if someone came into your office and said, hey, I want my um, caregiver to have power of attorney over me? How would you examine that? That's, an, that's a good question. Uh, normally, I'm not put in a position where it's a stranger that – that my client is suggesting giving this power to, and I'm using stranger in the legal sense of the word. Sure. It's not a family member. Um, but, you know, I guess my, my questions would be probably similar, quite frankly, to, to all of you listening, is that we'd want to know how long has this person been in your life? Where do they come from? Who are they? What's their background? 
and I would want to be satisfied that there aren't character issues. I'd probably still suggest we do a background check um, that those things are easily done. And the person, if they objected to that sort of background check, then that would probably be a sign that maybe they shouldn't occupy this role. I would also suggest to my client, if they had family member alternatives, that perhaps they consider naming two, which they could. Um, it, it's There's no reason, incidentally, that you can't have three people in that role. But the problem, of course, is that if you need a unanimous decision to get anything done, then it can drag things down. Right. Uh, but if you have two people and there's a good relationship, then then that'll, that can work well. And it could be that the second person is really just doing oversight and that they're just okaying it, you know, routinely. In other words, there's no mm-hmm. reason, if there's no reason to suspect it, they'll okay it. So it doesn't mean that the two are equally involved. But I like that because it allows one person to say no if they don't have all the facts. You can also give veto power in another person. So they would they'd have authority that they can choose to not exercise, but if they choose to, they can override the authority of the person holding the durable power. So who would have the veto power? A third person. Oh, it a could third be like person. a family member. Okay. It, but you know, in this case, this guy was really out of family members. Sure. And so there are people in that situation. And furthermore, especially in Florida, you have people living there whose kids are in New Jersey, right, Missouri. And so those kids are often not in a position to participate. But you could still have that the kids be named as co-holders uh, of a durable power of attorney, co-agents. And that doesn't mean that they participate all the time. It means they can. Okay. Uh, so I'm nervous with a scenario in which somebody has carte blanche and my client doesn't hasn't known them for many years. Often I'm worried, quite frankly, if my client has known them for many years. There's no perfect solution to this. So as as each of you listen to to this story and about these devices, you you know may scroll through your mind to see who are those people that you would envision those roles. But always name a successor. And if you feel uncomfortable, name a, a co-agents. And, and if you feel further uncomfortable, put a triggering event so that it only comes into effect when this triggering event occurs. Uh, but remember, that's not a fix if you think the person may not be honest because you're really vulnerable when you're incompetent, not mm-hmm. when you're competent. Uh, but still, some people feel better in not having the person have access until they're incompetent. And that would be declared if you say, okay, I want two doctors to uh, state that I'm incompetent, or you can arrange it any way you want. Yeah, you can. Uh, the triggering device is up to you. It's just that to the extent that you make it unclear, to the extent that there's any ambiguity, remember what the implication of that is. It's that they end up going to a bank, and it's the person that they're going to present this to. It's not the corporate counsel. It's not a person with a law degree. It's a clerk. Right. And the clerk is going to see that this power of attorney is subject to a condition. So immediately that makes clerks nervous. They start thinking, well, is this valid or not? How do I know this condition's occurred? And and even though you might have a certified signature there, it makes them nervous. So what does that do? It means that the clerk, almost without exception, sends it up to the 50th floor to the corporate lawyer. And it's going to go into an end basket. It's going to probably sit there for a day or two maybe, or more. And anyway, the lawyer's going to look at it, approve it, and then eventually you will be able to have this person functioning, doing the things you want them to do. So this bringing provision, it can be a wonderful thing, but you need to know that it can also produce some drag on the process. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about having a trust, and that's the best way to go. And even in this situation, but you have to have someone, I mean, this gentleman, he didn't have anyone left. Yes. And a trust is not a perfect alternative. I mean, the trusts have vulnerabilities too. What's good about them though, is you have the assets in a single place. You have a single set of rules that you've, you've spelled out as to how the assets are to be handled. You're subject to a fiduciary duty, which technically you are as a, as somebody who holds a durable power of attorney as an agent. But I can tell you as a practical matter, trustees, there's a ton of documentation and you're more likely to get somebody who who is a professional, they're underwilling to take a role that is defined in a trust versus that sort of blank check 
responsibilities associated with a durable power of attorney. That makes some professional fiduciaries nervous. Yeah. Just because there's just their assets they may not know about, their responsibilities they may not know about. Whereas within the trust, they can identify what they're responsible for, and, and there are systems in place well established as how to manage trusts. So trusts are clean. They're simple. They're in one place. They bypass probate entirely. So you solve that problem, uh, which is one of their biggest virtues. And depending on how you set it up, it can provide asset protection. And a trustee, if you don't have a, a living relative or a close friend, a trustee could be the attorney or it could be, say, a bank. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And incidentally, I, we should point out, too, that the trustee can also be the person who holds a durable power of attorney. Now, we don't know, in this this case we're talking about now, we know that this person has a significant amount of assets. I'm curious to what extent there was a will in place. Um, in this case, I think that there may not have been any estate planning because I've not seen it mentioned. And so there was an opportunity to deplete the estate so there nothing ever would have made it that way. Was there a mention of that? There wasn't a mention of uh, Marisa specifically, but she was managing uh, Virginia's at the time, his daughter. The daughter that died, the yes, 61-year-old. The, the okay. 61-year-old daughter that died. Oh, she, so the daughter had used this same uh, agent? No, the, the da- when the daughter died, her estate was being managed by the agent Tracy Hudson. Now, this is interesting. This is an interesting twist. I didn't know this. Yes. So, um, so you, well, you know, in fairness, I mean, something that you can say on behalf of Tracy was the daughter chose this person, if she named her in her will. We don't know that. But if she was named in the will, it, it could have been appointed by the executor could have chosen to have her involved in this role. Oh, no. It, it was after the fact. So uh, Virginia passes away, and then she gets signed as the power of attorney for Maurice. But Maurice is still having to deal with Virginia's estate as the agent of Maurice. That That's now Tracy's role, as it were, managing Virginia's estate on top Got of it. Maurice's affairs. All right. Interesting. Now yes. that our listeners are totally confused. Yes, everyone <laughs> went cross-eyed. No, no. So let, let me clarify this a little bit yes. for our listeners is um, – and the point that Dan was making is that because this woman had the power of attorney that she had, then she stepped into the shoes of the father. Maurice. Maurice. And so she's in a position to control or manage the estate. Either Maurice would have been an executor or simply as a, a primary beneficiary. The bottom line is that, that this professional guardian ends up in control of the estate of the deceased daughter because she's in the shoes of the father. Because she's acting on his behalf. She yeah. be, like you said at the beginning, you become that person. And, and this, is, this is a good point to make. It does show you how scary it can be when you give this, this identity mm-hmm. to someone, how, how it can ramify into their having control of things that you couldn't imagine happening. And, and I'm sure that Mr. Myers didn't envision that this professional guardian with the durable power of attorney would be in a position to run his daughter's estate. So, Absolutely lessons to be learned with this one. <laughs> so many consequences when you try yeah. to, and all of it relates to anticipating the unknown. Mm-hmm. So I guess we should wrap up. We're out of time. So I think that, that we can say that protecting yourself as you become increasingly old, increasingly vulnerable, requires a lot of forethought and a lot of planning, but it's definitely worth the effort. Clearly, we can see that time and time again on this show. Absolutely. Time has flown. All right. Till next time, another episode of Elder Talk. Take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Joe Cordell, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Please listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Joe Cordell, sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.